Hi guys, welcome to my channel. Today I will unmask some aspects of blood pressure that you never thought about. And, you know, I know the first question is, is it possible to have a masked hypertension uh, because you're wearing a mask, right? Well, that's not exactly what this video is about, but I do want to get started first by welcoming you to my channel. I'm Dr. Hampton, and I'm on a mission to help you achieve metabolic health. And before we get started, I wanted to dedicate this video to a fellow carnivore, Mr. Aquino, and he's on his way to achieving metabolic health He's a wonderful guy. He's inspired me. I hope I continue to inspire him. I also want to do a shout out to Carrie of Homestead Howe. As you can see from my shirt, uh, we're working on this great documentary. We love to eat meat. And the reason why we love to eat meat, because we think it's a great way to heal. So I'll make sure I have a link in the notes to this video to make sure you can support that great documentary. So Carrie, keep doing your thing and I will keep doing mine. So before we learn about mast hypertension, let's talk a little bit about the many complications uh, that can occur from just having an elevated blood pressure or a blood pressure that's uncontrolled. Now, as you know, the blood pressure is all about the blood vessels. And if your blood vessels are damaged, it can cause a lot of damage to your body, starting with your brain. So the blood vessels in your brain, if they get damaged, your risk for a stroke is higher and something called hypertensive encephalopathy. So we don't want to get that. We love our eyes. We all need to see. And one of the things that can happen with uncontrolled blood pressure is something called hypertensive retinopathy. And of course, we love our heart. Nobody wants to be holding their chest with a heart attack. And so the risk of that is higher when you have uncontrolled blood pressure as well. There's something called hypertensive cardiomyopathy. As you know, that's when the heart is large. And of course, nobody wants to be on dialysis. Did you know that life expectancy is five to 10 years? So nobody needs to be on dialysis if we can avoid it. Uncontrolled blood pressure will also increase your risk for that. And finally, whenever your blood pressure is elevated, you're likely to have an elevated blood sugar. It's part of that hyperinsulin metabolic uh, dysfunction state that you uh, uh, can get insulin resistance. So again, all of these are possible complications and we really want to make sure you don't have to deal with any of that. Now, if we think about stroke, right, uh, it's really important to understand that your blood pressure is the most consistent predictor of a possible stroke. What's really interesting, none of us think about a blood pressure of 120 or 30 as a problem, but think about this, guys. If you have a blood pressure baseline at 115 and it goes up only 20 millimeters of mercury to 135, your risk for having a stroke doubles. Now, let's not imagine going up to 155. Now your risk has quadrupled. So this is why this video is so important. This is why having normal blood pressure is so important. So in 2014, uh, there was the uh, JNC8 recommendations. And this is one of the organizations that doctors like myself, advanced practice clinicians use to make decisions. So, so what they found is that for the general population up to the age of 59, uh, starting at 18 for people with diabetes and for uh, chronic kidney disease, we're going to target a blood pressure of less than about 140 over 90. Now, where things got a little controversial is with those over the age of 60. And at that point, they relaxed the criteria. So they allowed those people to have a, a blood pressure that was a little bit higher. Now, that makes a little sense because if you reduce the blood pressure too low, particularly in people who are older, there is the risk that you don't perfuse or bring enough blood to the brain and the kidneys in particular. So they were very worried about that. Um, but one of the reasons why I don't want to over-treat people and try to use lifestyle, so metabolic health docs like myself, uh, they try to use lifestyle because when you do that, you simply uh, heal you re and then you start to de-prescribe or reduce the medicines uh, that people are taking because really the medicines uh, that you're still on when you heal that can lead to your blood pressure getting too low. So I think that's a huge message I want to emphasize and we need to train more people to learn how to de-prescribe and not rely on medicines alone. Now, three years after JNC8, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association got together and instead of uh, relaxing the targets, 
they actually make the targets even harder to achieve. There's two exceptions, people with cardiovascular disease and for secondary prevention of stroke. As you can see to the right, the blood pressure goal ended up being less than about 130 over 80 uh, versus uh, the previous target of 140 over 90 with the uh, JNC8. So, uh, so you have two different narratives here. And so when you're talking to your doctor and they're trying to give you a target, you may see some variation from a previous doctor because they may be following different guidelines or the organization. So I just want to put that in front of you so you'll understand why there may be some variation and why you need to at least have that awareness. Now, another organization that makes recommendations for doctors is called the Preventive Services Task Force. It's abbreviated USPSTF. Now, this organization uh, has a recommendation that's not that uh, old, it's newer, and it's all about getting blood pressures outside of the office setting. They feel that that's a more accurate reflection of what your blood pressure is. And it kind of makes sense because you're in the office for, you know, maybe three or four times a year. You're, you know, you're not there very long. They do this one blood pressure, maybe they repeat it, and they're going to make all the decisions based on that. Wouldn't it make more sense to have more data outside of the office? So they have this ambulatory uh, blood pressure approach where you literally walk around with a blood pressure cuff and it checks your pressure periodically. And of course, you got the home blood pressure measurements. So, so it's really important that we know that this is important so that you can participate in collecting data for you and your doctor to use to make decisions. Now, as it relates to what the American Heart Association thinks, uh, what's the best way to get your blood pressure done at home, it's probably best to use that upper arm monitor instead of using a wrist or a finger monitor. So keep that in mind, those other types of monitors, wrist and finger are not as reliable. And so I wouldn't really rely on that unless you have no choice. And then of course, uh, make sure the cuff is the right size, work with your pharmacist or other team member to make sure that you have the right cuff. I uh, just wanted to put in front of you what an ambulatory blood pressure monitor looks like. Uh, and as you can see, every 60 minutes, or every 15 to 30 minutes, your blood pressure is recorded over 24 hours. And that's another approach that they recommend. The problem is that having access to this is limited. So more than likely, you'll end up just doing a home blood pressure cuff. But you should mention that to your doctor just in case the health system that you're in have, gives you access to that. Now, one of the types of hypertension that we're familiar with is that white coat hypertension. Some people also call it reactive hypertension. That type of hypertension is the type where your blood pressure is elevated in the office. Of course, uh, that can be for many reasons. You're nervous. Maybe uh, you were running to get there on time, or maybe you just had an argument with somebody and your blood pressure is elevated. So that's what we call uh, white coat or reactive blood pressure. And of course, then your blood pressure is at home with uh, ambulatory blood pressure me measurements or home blood pressure measurements are going to end up being uh, normal. Now, the complete opposite, which is what the this video is about, is called mast hypertension. And in those folk, the blood pressure is normal in the office and is elevated when measured uh, at home, whether you're doing an ambulatory version or just your home blood pressure monitor. So it's kind of I, you know, crazy that such a thing exists, but it does. So, so this video is about just creating awareness about that. And I want to start uh, with what are the common causes. But before I speak to the common causes, I just want to say something to those of you who uh, come to the doctor's office and the only time you take the medicine is right before you see your doctor. And, and the problem with that approach is that you may get a good grade, the doctor is proud of you, et cetera, but you're really not serving the doctor, you're not serving yourself. So I really encourage you, if you're on medicine, please take the medicine, not just for the doctor's appointment, but also uh, when you're at home or at work or play. So, so let's look at the causes, guys. Some of the risk factors include just being a male, older age, uh, being a smoker, uh, of course, excessive alcohol consumption, stress, uh, not being at your ideal body weight. Uh, we're familiar with metabolic syndrome because I'm in the metabolic health doc. That includes blood pressure, blood sugar, triglycerides, HDL, and your belly fat. And of course, sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a 
uh, a big cause of uh, high blood pressure. In fact, I'll probably make a separate video just focused on sleep apnea. So those are the causes and the risks. Uh, so what about treatment? It's pretty straightforward. It's all about lifestyle. It's okay to use medicine. I think medicine should be bridge therapy for both, most of us who can heal. Some of us may have to take medicine, but consider medicine uh, bridge therapy. And, and just always remember that that's the better approach to uh, do well. Now, you'll notice uh, for choosing the heart-healthy diet part, uh, I kind of got the DASH diet uh, kind of a little line through it, right? Now, the reason why that line doesn't go through the entire diet of the DASH diet is because, you know what? Compared to the standard American diet, uh, it's probably okay to eat a DASH diet compared to a, um, and I'll show you what that looks like in a moment, but compared to like the standard American diet, it's, it's okay. Uh, <clears throat> but it's also true that the keto diet is better, and I'll show you why in a, mo in a moment. But the other lifestyle changes are obvious. We got to move. We got to get our weight down. We got to limit the alcohol. Obviously, smoking causes constriction, so you don't want to do that. And then we got to deal with our stress and sleep. That's why I call it protecting your nest, nutrition, exercise, less stress, more sleep. Those concepts are universal, and we have to consider those as we're trying to heal. Now, here's why the DASH diet is not my favorite. It is my opinion that eating seven to eight servings of grain, as you look toward the bottom of this pyramid, is too much. Uh, nothing about eating bread and cereal is good for you, in my opinion. Therefore, I think the DASH diet has no chance to beat the keto diet. And of course, eight to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables doesn't sound bad on his, on his face. And you've been spent, you spent your whole life being told eat fruits and vegetables, but half of that, if it were fruit, that would be a lot of sugar. So if you eat literally eight servings of grains plus five servings of fruit, you're going to have a high blood sugar. You're going to have insulin resistance. You're going to have inflammation, hyperinsulinemia, and you're going to have a high blood pressure. So that's why I don't think a DASH diet is the perfect diet, but it does clean up some of the processed foods you have with the standard American diet. Now, here's a little evidence to support the keto diet. And this is a study that was recorded uh, in the Annals of Family Medicine. And this study shows that the low carb or keto, this is very low carb, so they're talking about keto, was uh, twice as effective for hypertension, three times more effective for prediabetes and diabetes, and uh, twice as effective for overweight and obesity. So there's no question that the evidence supports that type of di dietary pattern. So, so my hope is that this video just provided a little perspective about the different types of high blood pressure. Um, my hope also is that your doctor or advanced practice clinician will encourage you and work with you to adopt lifestyle changes. That's the main way to heal from a high blood pressure. And if you do that, you won't have to deal with all of those complications that come with a high blood pressure. So I really appreciate you. If you have anybody in your family who's dealing with high blood pressure, they have a family history of high blood pressure, or they simply want to learn more, share this video. Of course, like and subscribe, comment. Uh, in the comments, tell me, have you ever heard of mast hypertension? Was that a new term to you? And if so, share anything you'd like to share with my audience. So guys, thank you again. And until we meet again, continue to be safe, be well, and continue to protect your nest.